Herzlich willkommen am dritten Tag der Frankfurter Buchmesse und ganz herzlich willkommen am Stand der Zeit und ganz herzlich willkommen einem der größten Stars äh, der französischen Literatur, der Prix Goncourt, Preisträgerin und wunderbaren Autorin. Herzlich willkommen, Laila Slimani. Thank you, thank you. Dankeschön. Wir werden weder Französisch noch Deutsch, sondern einfach <laughs> uns in der Mitte treffen. Uh, so we're going to talk English. Yeah. All right? If that's okay. I uh, hope that's okay with you. So welcome at this uh, place. I just, uh, we're talking about your latest novel, or the second part of the trilogy that you're working on. But in between, you have been uh, writing a book about writing and about isolation. Uh, and uh, there I learned about your dream of isolation your dream of loneliness, your dream of saying no uh, to people and to friends. Uh, so I say, uh, welcome at the <laughs> place of isolation in Frankfurt. Um, no, I like you. I like you anyway. <laughs> I like to be alone, but I like you. <laughs> How's your time so far in Germany? How's the, the, reading, uh, the reading tour uh, taking place? Honestly, it was really great. I was in Stuttgart and in Basel. Yesterday night I had an event in the theater in, in Frankfurt. Like 700 people came, very warm, very, it was very, very moving. And I have to say that um, Germany is a very special place when you are a, a writer. People are really, really uh, fond of reading and really involved. And um, it's really great to have the luck to, to have a German audience, really. Interesting. You know what we say about France. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure you say a lot of things. Yeah, tell me. What do you say? It's the country of, uh, of literature. Yeah. It's the country where, where all the people go to the, to, <laughs> to, to the readings. Yeah, uh, but you know in Paris, when you are having an event in Paris, very often people don't come because there are so many, so many things in, in Paris, in, in bookstores or in libraries. Very often it's empty. People don't, don't show. So, yes, people love literature. That's true. And writers have a very big uh, position, I think, in the French society. But it's not so true that people show for the, for the events when it comes to having presentations like that. So you see, we are double happy about, uh, <laughs> double happy about all you uh, being here. When you uh, grew up, you had this kind of, well, we had, or many of us had pictures of pop stars on, on the walls. You had them as well, but your pop stars were uh, different ones. Those were authors, I think. Yeah, that's where I had the poster of uh, Baudelaire, I had Simone de Beauvoir, I had uh, Edgar Allan Poe. For me, they were the biggest rock stars or the biggest pop stars because they were all having a love of love affairs and passions. Many of them were drug addicts or alcoholic. They killed themselves and I was like, wow, that's so great. <laughs> They had syphilis and things like that that were so romantic. And when I was 15 years old, I wanted, yeah, to be a drug addict and to have syphilis. But then I understood that it was not that great. Good. <laughs> what can you What can you say so far about your own pop star life? What where, is there? Was there at least no. one single thing that you dreamed of that came true? I'm trying to build a reputation of a rock star. I tell to my uh, publicist, can't you say that I'm having some flow, that I drink too much, or <laughs> people would be maybe interested? But I'm not a rock star. I think I don't have this kind of character. I'm very. Yeah, I'm very ordinary, very common. Okay, ever thought of uh, someone who is doing an Instagram ac account from you and uh, pretending yeah, a why more not? adventurous yeah, life? You, you know, I'm not on social media and I hate social media. That's not my, my thing. I think that if you want to live happy, it's good to live um, hidden. Pour vivre heureux, vivons cachés. So, mm -hmm. no, I don't really want to share my, my life, my private life. And I think that, um, you know, a writer, when you write something, you give it to a pl publisher, the relationship you have with people is very special. Uh, I don't want to publish my world on social media. It's not the same. I think that a, a writer has to think about everything he's writing, everything he's telling, and not just say, oh, today for breakfast I had granola. Who cares? Many people, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one author you quote in this book is Stefan Zweig, who is like more than 100 years ago, he says, well, it's incredible living in this time. All, every day you have to decide, every day you have to make a public uh, appearance. Uh, what do you think um, what Stefan Zweig might say about our times today? 
Yeah, and uh, I think that for all the writers, that's the big question, the, the question of saying no and not being all the time a public figure. Uh, when I won the Concours Prize, a lot of uh, media and people were asking me for interviews and all this. And at the beginning, it was quite funny, especially because I was a woman, I was from Maghreb, I was Muslim, so in France, people wanted me to be a sort of icon. But then I understood that I will also have to pay the price for this because uh, it takes a lot of time and because people at the beginning they make you an icon and then they just want to destroy the icon because no one really likes uh, this kind of, of figure. So I understood that I needed to take some distance and to say no, no, no and to be in my solitude and to write and to do my job which is just writing. But still, uh, when uh, talking about role models, uh, I think you uh, sometimes say that there are actually uh, two of them. Emile Zola on one side, uh, the public intellectual who wants really uh, to well, have influence on daily life and on politics. And on the other side, Rainer Maria Rilke, for example, who is just looking inside of himself. How do you decide what Laila Slimani is uh, waking up in the morning? Yeah, I try to find a balance. Uh, I try to be Emile uh, Rilke uh, in a certain mm -hmm. way. Uh, to be, uh, I think when I have something that I'm really, really angry against, or when I feel that I need to say something, I do it, and uh, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to, yeah, to, to be very sincere about what I think. But at the same time, uh, I'm not afraid also that, you know, a lot of artists today, or a lot of writers, are afraid that people are going to forget about them. They think that they have to be all the time on the media, all the time have something to say, have a photograph to, 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 to send on the social media, and I'm not afraid of that. I don't really care. So I think what is important is to find a balance. And about this question of role model, for a very long time, I didn't really believe in, in that. When people were telling me, oh, you know, you are a role model for girls, or you are an icon, things like that, I was really, no, I, I, I didn't want that. And one day, I was in Iceland and uh, in a festival, and I met um, a very famous um, poet uh, from Syria. And uh, this man was very melancholic, very depressed, and we had a long conversation. And he told me that uh, in 2016, he was in Damascus, and he was watching TV. He has three girls. He was watching TV with his girls, and uh, they saw on TV uh, me winning the Goncourt Prize. And one of the girls said to him, so an Arab woman can do that. And when he told me that, I was really, I was crying. I was really moved. And I told myself, you can't say that it doesn't exist. That's, yeah, being a role model, sometimes it counts. Because maybe some girls around the world who are from Maghreb, who are from the Arab world, will think that it's possible to write, to be free, to travel around the world, and uh, yeah, to be a writer. Yeah, and let's, uh, let's turn to the, uh, the recent novel uh, that you just published, or has just been published in Germany, Schaut wie wir tanzen. It's the second part of a planned trilogy. We're looking forward to the third part, but this is the first one. And of course, this is, it's not the story of a family, but I think, uh, well, it's the idea, or many, many biographic uh, facts are actually your family. So it's the kind of how you became who you are or the, the, the writer you are uh, these days, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's a sort of an investigation on myself and on my, my family. Um, I think that, you know, I, I knew my grandparents very well and my, my father also who died when I was like 20. But the conversation between me and my father or between me and my grandmother ended. And in a way, what I like with being a writer is that you can live with ghosts. Death doesn't exist in literature. Past doesn't exist. You can make this life that ended, you can make it come again. And this word that doesn't exist anymore, it can exist again in, in a book. So I tried to uh, understand and to recreate the life of my grandparents and the youth of my parents. 
and it helps me a lot understand not only who I am, but to understand my country, to understand my parents. I think like many people uh, in my family, there was a lot of silence, a lot of things that we didn't talk about because of shame, because of taboo, because we didn't have the time. And so writing this book helps me understand all those things that we didn't talk about. Wow, and how did you make the people uh, talk? Um, actually, they are all dead, so they didn't really talk. Um, I just tried to remember all the, the things that my grandmother told me when I was a child. My grandmother was a wonderful storyteller. Uh, I'm really sure that if my grandmother had the chance to study, and if she had the chance to have the, a room of her own, like Virginia Woolf said, my grandmother would have been a great writer. She would probably have written some big bestsellers because she was a wonderful storyteller and she had a certain sense of uh, suspense. And uh, I remember when I was a child and it was really, really hot in McNess during the summer, we couldn't sleep. And all the girls, uh, my, my sisters and my cousins, we were sleeping with her and she would tell a story and we were all like that. And then, then what happens? It was, she was really great. And she told me a lot of stories about her childhood, about the war, about how she met my, my grandfather. And my grandmother, like my grandfather, they didn't have any problem with lying. They would lie very often just because they wanted the story to be, to be good. There is this story that I tell very often about my grandfather who had a scar on, on his belly. And one day we were at the beach and I saw the scar, maybe I was seven or eight, and I asked my grandfather, what is this scar? And he said, oh, you know, I was attacked by a tiger in Germany, in the Forêt Noire in, in Germany. And I was like, wow. And I went back to school and I said to one of my friends, you know what? My grandfather was attacked by a tiger in Germany. And this friend came back the day after and he said, you're a liar. I talk with my parents and there are no tigers in, in Germany. And when I said that to my grandmother, she said, he's a fool, of course. They can be tiger in Germany if you decide that there is tiger in Germany. <laughs> so write a book and create tigers in Germany. <laughs> Great. And I think, uh, well, let's think uh, kind of the, sometimes told that's kind of the secret of the marriage of the uh, party, uh, lucky marriage of your of your parents. They were great inventors too, uh, and it's a secret that one invents a story when the other is with you. We all know this. Um, being in a marriage, someone tells a story, and the guy you are with you is saying, "What are you talking about? Yeah, it's not I true." I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> but the secret of this lucky marriage seemed to have been. Let the other guy tell his story and smile. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember some dinners with people and my father or my mother telling the story of um, travel that I never made in a, in a country that I didn't know at all. And my mother saying, oh, yes, I remember. It was so great. And oh, do you remember when we did this? They never did that. And I was looking at them. And, and now I'm doing the same thing. And I hate couples when, you know, the, the woman begin to tell the story and the husband is like, no, it was not exactly like that. <laughs> Let her tell her story. Stop that. And I hate that. And my husband, he always respects my lies. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> we did that. And he never, yeah, at the end, said me, why did you lie? He's like, at, and at the end, some lies become true because you tell them so much that you have the feeling that it's, it's true. <laughs> Great. And the technique, or, well, yeah, the idea of... Uh, your writing in this book especially is, of course, uh, right in between. Because we see the cover and it's obviously a, a picture and this has uh, something to do with your real family. So this is kind of fact. Uh, but at the very beginning of the book there is this quote from Boris Pasternak saying, uh, I love the freedom of not to care about the facts. That's the idea of literature. So. How do you balance this out? The real facts of this kind of, I think you have been talking to people from the Truth Commission in America, so there's really truth on the basis, uh, but on the other side, there's you. Yeah, I've been a journalist, so I know how important can facts be, and I know that truth is important. Don't be, don't, don't be worried about that. I lie a lot, but I know that truth is important also. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to novel, um, 
what I try to do is to um, read a lot about the history, about politics, about economy and all that, and to know exactly the context in which my characters are going to, to evolve. But I think that in a historic novel like this one, for me the most important is the life of the character and the intimacy of the character. What I try to do is really to describe the present of this family and not to be Leila Slimani with the information that I have now and to be, you know, um, to look at my, at my character and to judge them and to have more information than they have. My, I, I'm pretty sure that my grandmother and my grandfather didn't understand a lot about colonization and about the political context they were living in. They were farmers living far from the city. They didn't read the, the newspaper. So what was interesting for me is trying to exactly understand what could they understand about the context they were living in. And I think very few. Uh, for my parents, it was different because they were living at, at the end of the, um, the 60s. They were like 20 in a period where the, the young people were very, uh, were more informed, were more activists, were in a sort of a revolution against the, the old generation. So for this part, it's more, this part is more political and uh, the, the, the history and the context I think is more important than in the, the first one. So for me, what is important is really the character. What do they know and what do they understand of the, of the present? And I think that even us, we don't really understand much of what is happen happening around us. I'm sure we're coming back to the characters, of course, and to the picture, uh, especially, and to uh, the, a guy uh, being called Karl Marx in the center of the, <coughs> of the book. But uh, I think one uh, other important point for you was telling the story of your country, or the country where you have been born. And maybe, yeah, you tell a little bit about this historical situation. We started like <coughs> the end of the 60s, 68 in Paris, and 68 in, <coughs> in Morocco. Tell us a little bit about the political and uh, local situation. Yeah, uh, so um, the, more the, the Protectorat, the colonization in Morocco ended in 1956. So when the book begins in the, in the 60s, the Morocco is a young independent country with a young new king, Hassan the, the, the second. So it's a country with a lot of hope, with a lot of optimism. The young generation will have for the first time the, the opportunity to go to the university, to study, so there is this new generation of educated people who believe they can build a new country, a modern, independent country. And so it's a time of a certain happiness. When uh, At the beginning, when I interviewed people from this generation, and I asked them, what do you remember? And they all told me parties. I remember parties. I remember being drunk all the time and dancing all the time and, and smoking joint and going to cinema and uh, meeting girls or boys. And so uh, it was really, really a period of time and a period of, of happiness. And I was really surprised that they didn't tell me a lot about repression, about violence, about um, the putsch against the, the king. So I asked them, but it was also very violent. And they were surprised and they said, yeah, that's true and that's weird, but uh, it was like we were living in a bubble. And that's why I, I chose this title, uh, Watch Us Dance, because I think that they were so, yeah, so happy and so optimistic and they thought so much that they were going to do something that they were dancing and not looking at what was happening outside and all the violence that was surrounding them. So uh, this is a very ambiguous time with a lot of optimism but also a lot of darkness because at in the middle of the 60s, um, the, the students and the opponents began to attack the, the power of the king. And um, in 1971, they tried to kill the king in 72 also. And so there was a big, big repression. And I was born 10 years after in 1981. And my souvenir, my memory of this time is a very dark time. People would disappear. People would go to prison. Uh, we were all living in sort of paranoia. We were sure that people were listening to, to us. So voila, this is the end of an era and the beginning of another one. Okay. Yeah, and <clears throat> yeah, and one other topic of the book is, of course, the cliches that the French have of Morocco and, uh, well, people of Morocco of the French as well. And there was the time, 68, that uh, people from the West or from France or so were coming onto 
kind of uh, find, wow, Morocco, what a, the wild kind of, well, the wild people here, like Roland Barthes did come, Jimi Hendrix uh, uh, did come. And on the other side, going as a woman from Morocco, going to France, there was some kind of being, not even being seen because. Yeah, that's very funny. That's something that interested me a lot. The fact that um, for the beginning of the 20th century, you have colonization with this idea that Africans are from a lowest civilization, that they are not civilized enough, that they are savage and they need to be civilized and need to be educated and that French people will come and bring uh, uh, hospitals and trains and uh, all that and that they will help develop the, the country. And then they left and actually they didn't build a lot of hospitals and a lot of roads and a lot of trains. It was quite an illusion and then the hippie came in at the end of the 60s and they were like wow that's so great you are savage and there is no hospital and no train and nothing and we want to live like you we hate civilization and we hate modernity and so Moroccan people were like those white people are so weird one day they want <laughs> to make us a very modernized country and the other day they think it's so great to live like that so it was a ironic way for me to to to, uh, to show how sometimes the Western civilization and the Western people have very different point of view on what we should be and how we should live. And then, and the, well, pretty much at the beginning of the novel, there comes a guy who is uh, who tells himself or calls himself uh, Karl Marx. Tell us a little bit about this guy. And the, well, kind of a love story begins. Well, this is because I like it so much when the very uh, two words that he says uh, to Aisha, I write. And this seems to be some kind of a magical formula for her. Absolutely. So I'm the daughter of Karl Marx. Maybe you don't know that, <laughs> but I'm the daughter of Karl Marx. Karl Marx is my father, and uh, people used to call him Karl Marx because he had a very big beard. He had hair like this. He was a teacher uh, um, of economy, and when he was young, he was a communist. And it's a paradox because when he was older, he was the minister of economy of a very capitalistic country. So my father had this kind of uh, destiny where uh, when you are 18 or 20 and you are a revolutionary with a lot of ideas and you want to change the world and at 40 um, you do everything for the world not to change. So um, my yeah, this is the story of, of my father and uh, he, he met my mother in the same circumstance I'm, I'm telling in the book but he's really the incarnation of those young, uh, poor Moroccan people who had the possibility, the opportunity to study at the end of the 50s. My father was very brilliant and he went to French school because in, in Morocco during colonization, when a, a little boy was very brilliant, we would take one a kid per family to go to the French school. So my father went to this school and it was great for him because it gave him the opportunity to study and to have a career. But at the same time, it, I think it was something really hard for him because he became a stranger in his own family. My grandfather and my grandmother, he, they couldn't read or write. They didn't speak French. And the more my father grew old and the more he were educated and the more a distance began to be created between him and his family, my grandmother, who was completely crazy and very violent, she hated French language. And if, she, if, if you wanted to make her crazy, you would speak French in front of her. And she would beat my father each time they, she hear him uh, speak French. So there was a lot of tension uh, in, in this family. And my father decided to not have any relationship with his family. And he built his own life, his own career, his own past. Uh, he was always lying about his past and never really knew what was his childhood and never met his family and never went to the house where he, he was born and, and raised. So he was, he, he created his own myth. There are several great, great things about uh, your writing and about this novel especially. Once, one thing, of course, is the great story, incredible story. The other side, we've been talking about these living characters. They're really alive. But on the basic, for me, there is this really strong power uh, that is inside, this strong force. And you, I think sometimes you said that there is a wish for revenge for your father. 
for the life and death, the end of the life of your father, this revenge, and on the other side, some kind of healing or making something good again. Can you tell us about these two? Seem to be very, very different feelings, but they seem to come together in your writing and in your book. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people ask you when you are a writer very often, why do you write? And you're always trying to find a very spiritual and good answer. But the truth is that I write for very bad reasons. Um, I, I, I write for because of meaningness and because I want to revenge. I want a revenge for my father, for my mother. I want to clean my name in a certain way. And I want revenge against all the people who not only didn't believe in me, but didn't believe that it was possible for a girl like me to become a, a writer. My father lost his job when I was uh, 12 years old, and uh, he lost his passport, and he lost the possibility to, to work. And um, then when he was 61, and I was 20, he went to prison, and he died uh, just after that. And during this old period, of course, we lost everything. We lost friends, we lost uh, our status, social status. And it was very sad, but at the same time, it was really great because we become more free. We understood that all those people were hypocrites and that we were living in a lie. And when you understand that, when you lost everything, you have nothing else to lose. So you just want to, to party and to tell people to go mm, themselves. So it's, uh, at the same time, it was a really freeing m moment for me. And um, yeah, all the time I think of my father and I think of the injustice because 10 years after he was dead, the Moroccan justice recognized that it was a mistake and that he shouldn't have gone to, to prison. So I have the wanting to give him another life and to give him another destiny and to give him the possibility to be this boy, this Karl Marx who had so many ideas and so many dreams about about his uh, about his country and I want the life to be bigger because I think that he didn't have the chance to to live the destiny that um, that he wanted so so much and also there is a sort of uh, yeah also of, of revenge against all those people who made fun of of us when my father was in prison or you know I was going to school and people would make fun of me are oh, your father the big thief and uh, your father this and your father that And now my name is written on a book, not on a newspaper with insults. So it's something else, and I'm very happy that it's like this. Great. We're happy with you. Thank you. And you said, <coughs> actually, you wrote in this book as well. I mean, and we can feel it, and uh, we know that you're really, really in love with your father, really in love. But still, on the other side, you said, uh, if he wasn't dead, you hadn't become a writer. And you said, if you had the choice, Luckily, you don't have the choice, but if you had the choice, you would uh, choose writing, maybe. Yeah, I think that's very cruel, and uh, I understand if people maybe can be shocked about that, but sometimes I ask myself if I had to choose between my father living and me becoming a writer, I would choose writing. That's the truth. And uh, the truth is also that my father suffered so much that um, I think at the end, when he died, we felt that... Anyway, he didn't want to live anymore. My father said, I don't like life anymore. I'm so sad. He died of grief, you know. Uh, at the end, himself, he decided to abandon. He didn't want to, yeah, to be, to be alive anymore. So, yeah, I, I think that I'm living also for him. There is me, but he is with me all the time. I can really feel that, that he's here. And, um, yeah, I was very much in love with him. But I think it would have been very difficult for me to write and to write what I write if he was still alive. Hmm. And is he happy with you and with the book? Yeah, I think he is happy, yeah. Because the day, um, it, sometimes I have some signs of my, my father. Like a, a week ago, I was in, in Portugal. It was the birthday of my, of my father. And it was the launching of, of my book. And I was walking to the, the place where I was doing the launching. And I found uh, 100 euro on the floor. And I'm sure that's my father who gave <laughs> me 100 euro. And I was like, thank you, Dad. Cool. We're here to celebrate this uh, actual book, the second part of the trilogy, but at the very end of the book, uh, I have to mention, without spoiling, there's uh, somebody uh, coming to Earth, some person. Yeah. And I think it could, be, it could have uh, something to do with uh, you, is that true? 
Yeah, absolutely. The next book will be about uh, my generation, so the generation of my sisters and, and I. The, the, the child who is born at the end is more the generation of my sister, my older sister, but then there will be a character that is more inspired by me, but much more interesting than me and much more rock star and, uh, than, than me. <laughs> I think she will be a drug addict and a passionate and she will have all those things that I don't have. All that things that literature yeah. has been made of. For. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much indeed for thank joining you, us for so this much. great uh, talk. Thank you very much indeed for this book, but thank you very much indeed for you, Laila Slimani. Thank you, thank you so much.